Grace and peace from God, our Creator, and Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. Do you know what Hewlett Packard's best selling and longest lived product is? Though we associate HP with computers and printers that feature overpriced ink, their best product is neither of those things. No, it's something far humbler, a calculator. Specifically, it's the HP 12C financial calculator, which was first introduced in 1981. It quickly became the de facto standard for anyone who worked in the financial industry and is in fact still used today. If you were to go to Staples and look for it, you would probably find it for sale and you would probably notice that it had a particularly 80s style to it with its brass and brown color scheme and boxy buttons. And there's a reason for this retro look. The HP 12C has changed very little in the 40 years since its creation. Now in an age when our cell phones are out of date almost the moment that we purchase them, this might strike you as somewhat odd. How could something as simple as a calculator remain unimproved for over, well gosh, almost four decades? The answer is fascinating. HP has intentionally kept it the same, or more accurately, HP has intentionally given it the illusion of staying unchanged. Because technology has continued to advance, and in fact, the gory bits inside the calculator have been improved throughout the 40-year life of this device. However, HP discovered early on something very interesting. Advances in technology were such that they were able to significantly speed up the operation of the calculator. On the original version, complex calculations like the amortization of loans could take upwards of a minute for the little device to compute. By the late 80s, HP had a device that could do the same calculation nearly instantly. The trouble was, they discovered, users didn't like the new and improved version. They found that people did not trust the answers provided by the faster processor. In order for the answer to feel correct, it needed to feel weighty and significant. The users wanted the calculation to take time. So even as the technology inside has continued to improve and get faster, HP has intentionally slowed it down so that it would feel like it was working hard and pondering great thoughts that cranked through its numbers. I love this story because it stands in such contrast to the general trajectory of things in our modern world. In an era where everything is striving to be as instantaneous as possible, a world where we can send 140 characters at a time at the speed of light to anyone on the planet, and where we can order a book and have it on our front book step in the next day, or even faster if we're willing to forego the physical, the story of the HP 12C stands as a refreshing reminder that sometimes process is important and that taking your time has value. The truth is, I don't know what Jesus would think of our world of instant gratification, what he would say to a world where even the one to two days it takes for Amazon to deliver our latest purchases is considered to be too long and so much effort is spent on eliminating the gap between wanting and having. Actually, I take that back. I do have a suspicion about what he would say. Today, we have reached the end of the Bread of Life discourse, the lengthy teaching of Jesus delivered in the synagogue that we have been reading for the last five weeks. It all began, just as a reminder, because it was five weeks ago. It all began because those who had gathered around him had asked Jesus for a sign like Moses had given in the wilderness that they might believe. So Jesus responded with this prolonged discourse, describing himself as the bread from heaven that gives eternal life. You can almost hear the silence as Jesus' final words fall on the walls of the synagogue the crowd eyeing Jesus as they measure the weight of his words. Then, rejection. This teaching is difficult, they say to each other. We cannot accept it. 
With that, many of the crowd turn and walk away, leaving Jesus and his troubling words behind. Now, one school of thought is that these people who turned away were reacting to a literal interpretation of Jesus' words, that the bread of eternal life was his flesh and his blood was drink, and that those who wanted life must consume both. This line of thinking assumes that the people were turned off by the cannibalistic overtone of Jesus' words, and so turn away from what he had to say. Now, they may not have had calculators in Jesus' time, but that doesn't mean that people were stupid. I lean on the second school of thought that says that these people did understand the metaphor and knew exactly what Jesus was saying. They rejected his words because of the content of his teaching, not because of misunderstanding about what he said. So what was the message that Jesus spoke to the crowds they rejected? It is the same message, the same promise that has been spoken throughout history. In fact, the story of human history is the story of this message and our repeated rejection of it. It is a command to trust God. It is the promise that God will care for us and provide for us. The entirety of the Old Testament is the repeated narrative of God's promise to be with us, to lead us, to provide for us. All that we have, all that we are asked to do is trust in God. It sounds easy, but history shows that it is not. We want God on our own terms. We want, the God, we want God to be as we have imagined God should be. We want God to provide signs and miracles so that we might believe in God. But even when those signs and miracles come, we forget them quickly. Even when God proves God's trustworthiness and faithfulness time and again, we do not trust God. Why? Because trust takes time and it takes effort. We may think that our instant gratification world is a modern innovation, but really it's nothing new. Faith is a journey, but we are only interested in the destination. Faith takes time, but time is the one thing we are so often unwilling to give it. Moses led the people out of the bondage of Egypt. Almost immediately, they became impatient with the journey, wanting to know when they would reach the promised land and complaining about everything along the way, including the food. Fast forward to Jesus' day, and the crowds gathered around him and were hungry for salvation, but it was salvation from the empire and salvation from, the oppression, of, from oppression that they wanted, and they wanted it now. But the salvation Jesus offered was of another sort. The salvation he offered is a call to abide with him, to remain with him, and to follow him. It is a salvation that comes of the walking of a journey of faith and learning to trust in God and in Christ. The bad news is that we have not gotten any better at learning to trust God in the last 2,000 years since the time, that, since the time of Jesus. It may be even that we've gotten worse. We're surrounded by a thousand things that demand our attention, demand our time, demand our patience. We're all for spiritual journeys. In fact, we hunger for them, but we don't want them to put demands on our time, and we are very wary of placing our trust in them. We're much better at trusting things like the stock market, the economy, and even little calculators. The good news, however, is that our trust, our faith, depends not on us, but on God. Jesus' parting words to those who turned away from him that day were a reminder that all who come to him come because of God. It is a promise that God is always turning towards us, even when we are too busy turning away from God. It's a promise that God is waiting for the moment that we slow down enough to realize that God is already abiding with us. We must only choose to abide with God. It's a promise that it's never too late to start walking the journey of faith. For it is on that path that Christ meets us. Amen.